this morning we were discussing, we were discussing with you concerning mothers who have changed not only states or nations, but the world. If there's any hope for any nation, it would have to be in a mother's heart somewhere. And tonight, we're going to continue the message concerning the hand that rocks the cradle. Now, I hold in my hand a publication that was sent to my address having to do its report on International Year of the Child by the Oregon Women's League January of this year. In order that you might know the development, in 1924 the Assembly of the League of Nations adopted the Geneva Declaration of the Rights of the Child. In 1946, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations decided to revive the Geneva Declaration. In 1948, the United Nations General Assembly approved the adoption of a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 1950, the Social Commission of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations drew up a preliminary draft of a new Declaration of Children's Rights. 1957, the Human Rights Commission of the Economic and Social Council took up the question of adopting a Declaration of the Rights of the Child. In 1959, the Third Committee of the UN General Assembly, the Social, Humanitarian, and Cultural Committee, approved a revised draft. In 1959, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the Declaration of the Rights of the Child unanimously. 1975, the UN declared 1975 to be International Women's Year. President Ford appointed the first IWI Commission to attend the World Conference for Women in Mexico City. From this emerged the World Plan of Action, fully endorsed by the U.S. Commission, and the next IWI Commission was appointed by President Carter with Bella Abzug as um, chairman. 1976 through 1985, the UN designated this period to be International Women's Decade. 1979, President Carter designated this year as IYC, International Year of the Child by Executive Order 12503 authorizing appointment and funding of a national IYC commission. He has appointed a 25-member commission chaired by Mrs. Andrew Young. And uh, I think we need to look in for a second to see uh, where all these same birds of one feather come from. The first international seminar in preparation for International Year of China was held by WIDF on October 2nd, 1977 in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Featured speaker was Marie uh, Kabrilova, chairwoman of Czechoslovak Women's Union. The theme of her speech claimed that children in socialist countries have already been liberated. She also stated that the children in capitalist nations, that's ours, and children in undeveloped nations must also be liberated. This statement comes, uh, resolutions passed at the National International Women's Year meeting in Houston in 1977, and Brother Cameron, our group, was there, furnish a clear picture of their goals. Among the many recommendations are reproductive freedom, that's abortion, sexual freedom, homosexuality, non-sexist education at, at all levels, and restructuring the existing institutions. Rearrange the home, if you please. All the IWI resolutions are based on the premise that the federal government is the answer to everyone's personal problems from the cradle to the grave. One reason they say that is because they're getting money from them. 
Now let me give you some things. They said that uh, the children are to be liberated. Number one, they're to be liberated from traditional morals and values. Gloria Steinman said, notice, quote, By the year 2000, we will, I hope, raise our children to believe in human potential, not God. Liberated from parental authority, I quote, We recommend that laws dealing with the rights of parents be re-examined and changed where they infringe on the rights of children. Amendments should reinforce the primacy of the rights of the child. Humanist psychologist Richard Farson gives a vivid account of his vision of the liberated child of the future, advocating children's rights freedom from physical punishment, freedom to vote, total sexual freedom, economic freedom, and others in a Children's Bill of Rights by Richard Farson. He's a modern idiot. The following are excerpts from Report to the President, White House Conference on Children. We recommend that institutions and programs that affect children be required to actively involve children in their planning and decision-making processes. Emerging experimental structures which affect, affect children include homosexual couple and child family, commune family, group marriage, Recommendations, there is a need to make visible the increased variability in family forms. We do not favor any particular family form. And if you didn't get that, that means that homosexuals can have a home and a family and adopt children just like everybody else. That's of the devil. Children should have the opportunity to evaluate existing educational materials as well as have a voice in planning and developing new materials, they should also play active roles in school boards, school lunch and transportation boards, community, community planning, and local newspapers. Well, they could probably do about as good as some of the papers are doing. But that's unscriptural. Opportunity to refuse without penalty or embarrassment to participate in ceremonies and activities expressing loyalty to our agreement with any belief or symbol, freedom to follow their own taste in clothing and grooming. Look like they've been doing that mostly anyhow. Laws relating to parental custody change so that the child's right to have a proper home supersedes the parent's right to retain custody. Of any age, I notice this, any age abortion if performed by a licensed physician in a licensed facility. Yes, sir, just so it's licensed by the state. Legal counsel to enforce all rights of children because legal accountability without counsel is meaningless. And then here comes the child advocate or the lawyer. He is exclusively committed to the interest and welfare of children who seek his help or he has the duty to seek out those unable to ask for help. If a little child is too dumb to find the lawyer, the lawyer goes out and finds the dumb child. Said, I'll fight your battle for you. The child shall be protected from practices which may foster racial religious, or any other forms of discrimination. No Baptist mother and dad have a right to teach their particular doctrines to their child. That's Tommy Rod. That's known to the state as brainwashing. Now then, notice, liberated from nationalism and patriotism, as long as the child breathes, the poison air of nationalism. That means loving old glory. That means loving his nation that gave him birth. That's the poison air 
of nationalism. Education and world mindedness can produce only rather precarious results. As we have pointed out, it is frequently the family that infects the child with extreme nationalism. I've tried to pass out that infection myself. I've been infected with that ever since I was a little child in a one-room schoolhouse. I close by saying, liberated, they say, from capitalism. The UN Declaration for IYC refers to its connection to the Declaration and Program of Action on Establishment of New International Economic Order to establish a new international economic order that is to replace all capitalist economies with socialism. And that's the end of America. No way for her to exist as a great nation as long as she holds to such horrible tenets and are taught and financed by your tax dollars. This is what's arisen because of it. Fresco Gay Community Maintains Commitment to Political Action. Quote, Look, I know this might sound amusing, but I'm serious. The San Francisco Police Department, for the first time ever, is actively recruiting officers who are homosexual. Please take one of the leaflets and give me a call, he said. And the police department is actively seeking gay officers the Sheriff's Department already has 12 openly gay deputies. That's the reason I wouldn't want to live in California. I think she's got to go. Now then, let's come a little closer home. And then we're going to come to Mother. Television, America's mightiest influence by Edward E. Hanson. A United Press International article said that a burglar, listen to this, a burglar broke into a Chicago apartment occupied by a man and his three children, ages 9, 11, and 12. After a struggle, the burglar killed the father. Ten hours later, the police were contacted by a neighbor who had discovered the dead man lying in a pool of blood a few feet from where the children were totally occupied watching television. They were 9, 11, and 12. Their daddy was killed, but they never did let it interfere with their watching another killing. The television generation, people born since 1950, make up 60% of the United States population. 97% of all American homes have a television. More than are equipped with refrigerators and indoor toilets. I'd like to correct that they are indoor toilets. If you can't enjoy this kind of preaching, maybe you need to reevaluate your convictions. The average family watches over six hours of TV per day, 42 hours per week. The average American of the television generation will watch nine years of total television by the time he or she is 65 years of age. That's nine years gone down the drain. Nine solid years gone down the drain. By the time a teenager is 15, he or she has witnessed 13,000 acts of violence on television. There are more acts of violence in two nights of prime time television than in all of Shakespeare's plays combined. The nation's largest circulating daily newspaper has two million readers, but a television show that enters less than 30 million homes is considered a failure. As a child passes through infancy, childhood, and adolescence, it's exposed to 26,000 hours 
of television. In San Diego County, California, a 19-year-old boy chopped his parents and his sisters to death and crippled his brother with an axe. The boy was a high school student, honor student, and athlete who modeled the murder after a made-for-television movie about Lizzie Borden, who murdered her parents with an axe in 1892. According to the recent book, Remote Control Television and the Manipulation of American Life, by Mankiewicz and Swerdlow, several teenage murders have been inspired by violence on television. 1973, a 17-year-old admitted memorizing every detail of a murder movie and reenacting the crime of murder rape, just as he'd seen it on television. The powerful influence of America's greatest media shapes almost all public opinion regarding the family, moral issues, behavior, and political issues. Television news tells us what our national priorities are. It influences our attitude towards sex roles, feminist liberation, legalized abortion, and so forth. TV has become the strongest single factor in American life, promoting an acceptance of adultery, homosexuality, and divorce. Viewers often find themselves rooting for prostitutes and drug addicts who become the good guys in the story. A recent study by the National Institute of Mental Health concluded that television is the most powerful single influence in American life today. Violence, vulgarity, and pornographic sex have become the major themes on television during the 70s. According to the statistics compiled by the television monitoring program of the National Federation for Decency, the emphasis on sex on primetime television increased 25 and 6 tenths percent in the fall of 1978, as compared to 1977. Eighty-eight percent of all sex depicted on television is outside of marriage. In one year of prime time, TV viewers were exposed to 11,596 incidents showing immorality. At the same time, over 4,000 incidents of cursing and profanity are heard in one year's time on television. 80% of all drinking of any beverage on TV is alcoholic beverages. Situation comedies especially make fun of moral issues. Viewer discretion, which is often advised before a movie, is before a comedy program. The more we laugh at sin as a nation, the more America's laughing at God and His holiness. We rate certain programs as mature when they're downright immature and indecent. Advertising is the bottom line in television. Some $450 million is spent annually on advertising soap operas, which are viewed regularly by 20 million housewives. The typical soap operas deal with such moral problems as abortion, venereal disease, euthanasia, incest, drug addiction, adultery, and child abuse rally are offering any solutions. The average TV viewer watches 350,000 commercials every 10 years, and they're not advertising Jesus. Now then, who has the most influence in America? It's not mother anymore. It's television. You'd say, what is the answer? There's only one answer. That's to get rid of it. There's no other answer. And so, many have joined Brother Olaf in these last few years, saying that public enemy number one is coming right straight out of Hollywood. Now, here's the text. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on this earth. To be disobedient to your parents is suicidal. It brings an early death and a shameful death and a disobedient death. I mentioned this morning the mother of the lawyer of the Bible that God trusted with the first five books. His name was Moses. He had the privilege of coming back to demonstrate immortality of the soul and meet Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. 
He was the one that, after 80 years of preparation, mostly by his mother. Dear friend, if Thariel had had his way, he would have become an Egyptian communist. But the mother taught that little boy what he needed to know. The one who delivered 350 million slaves was really not Moses, it was his mother. If she'd been obedient to the state rules and regulations, she would have had him thrown in the river. But her conviction said, my baby is more important than the rules of Pharaoh. My child is number one with me, and so she taught him as his wonderful babysitter what the convictions of her soul happened to be. Then I mentioned to you the Shunammite woman who became known for her great faith and for hospitality to God's servants. And then I'd like to mention, and these are world influencing mothers, though this mother has no notoriety, no publicity. You reckon what kind of mother David had? He had a daddy named Jesse. He didn't know anything about the mother. He must have had a wonderful mother. Little old David was obedient. I know if she got word about the king and she was still living, her heart was broken when he made some terrible mistakes and blunders and sin, but I believe that David had a great mother that spent time. He became, reckon he didn't hear her singing the great psalms and songs and at least some words that inspired him to write uh, the music. Don't you imagine he had a happy mother? Don't you imagine he had a praying mother? Don't you imagine he had a mother that had some great convictions and those teachings never got away from David. He became the head of the music department and the prior department of the Bible and wrote most of the songs and the psalms and also the great prayers of the Bible like Psalm 51 after his heart had been broken. And then there was a mother in the Old Testament that became the greatest influence in the lives of the kings. Her name was Hannah. She was a praying mother. Uh, she went to uh, a religious festival and uh, she refused to enter uh, the festivities. And instead she made her way to an altar of prayer. And there she fell, moved those believing lips until God heard from heaven and uh, underwent some criticism. And some even accused her of being drunk. And she said, no. If I'm intoxicated, I'm intoxicated with a burden for a boy. Oh, I don't want to be barren. I want to be the mother of a child. And God heard her prayer. And little Samuel, the oil man of the Old Testament, came to anoint the head of Saul, the first king, and the head of David from the house of Jesse. And Samuel, long after he'd gone to be with the Lord, was sought after in the darkness of the witch of Endor by the king Saul and said, I miss my preacher. I want my preacher. I want the man of God that poured the oil on this unworthy head and I've rejected the word of the Lord and I've been rejected by the Lord and I need the preacher to come back again. Brother, that all started with a dedicated mother. They no substitute. Never will be a substitute for a mother. The state is a sorry substitute for a mother. Babysitters, commercial babysitters and baby caretakers are sorry substitute for the one that walked into the maternity ward, gave birth to a child, and could say like Hannibal for this child. I pray. You want to know what's wrong with our children today? Look in the maternity ward. I said, go look in Mother's Department, and that's exactly where you're going to... Hear me now. I've seen great children come from a dedicated mother and a drunkard daddy. But hardly ever do you see a great child come from a drunkard mother or a wayward mother. Oh, this morning, when our precious graduate came and said, 
My mother gave me away, lived in sin and immorality, and then I came alone and practiced just what my mother practiced and gave my children away. Dear friend, it's hard for a little girl to be better than her mother. I'm saying in this message and maybe series of messages that we need dedicated mothers that will not compromise. Hannah was the one that shaped the preacher, that shaped the kings and the kingdoms. And then I'd like to speak a little bit about a mother. You don't hear much about her. You hear a lot about her husband. She was referred to, and she certainly was not a member of women's lib. Her name was Sarah. Her husband was called to leave her of the Chaldees, a very lucrative place. He was a tremendously rich man in her of the Chaldees. Sarah could have put up quite a fight and said, Abe, how stupid can you be? You mean we're going to leave all of our friends, all of my clubs, all of my social opportunities? And you mean we're going out? Where do you think we're going? He said, I don't know. He said, have you gotten a map or have you gotten a word from the Chamber of Commerce? He said, no, I never have been over there and I had no word. I'm looking for a city. She said, what kind of city are you looking? He said, a city not built with hands eternal in the heavens. That's what I'm looking for. Well, said, do you suppose you'll find it down here? He said, I'm going to look for it. And said, if you want to go, uh, get your bonnet and let's go. And she got her bonnet. And she recognized him as her Lord. That is, earthly Lord. That's Bible Lord. But I tell you what, if you want your wife to treat you as an earthly Lord, why don't you act like one? Our Lord would never curse, and He'd never drink, and He'd never smoke cigarettes, and He'd never fuss and cuss and raise Cain like the devil around the home. If you're going to be Lord of your home, act like the Lord in heaven. Sarah, did you know that Abraham and Sarah had a boy by the name of Isaac? Did you know they picked him out a wife by the name of Rebecca. Did you know that to Isaac and Rebecca were born Jacob and Esau, and two lovely grandchildren for Abraham and Sarah? And did you know that from Jacob came a little boy by the name of Joseph, the great grandchild of Abraham and Sarah? who became the nearest type to Jesus in the Old Testament. You say, where did he come from? came from great-grandmother and great-grandfather. Would you let me give you a little um, form that I found in the Bible today? L-E-T, let. You say, where did you get that? I got it from Grandmother Lois. Mother Eunice and grandson Timothy. That's L E T. He became a great young man and follow up, but he had a grandmother that had faith. He had a mother that had faith. And Paul said, Timothy, I believe if your grandmother had faith, your mother had faith, I'm constrained to believe that that same faith is in you. So the time to start rearing a child is with grandma.